Good day and welcome back to Canadian British Literature. This is part two in which we are continuing on into the 19th and early 20th century. There is a part one that talks about the foundations and the beginnings of Canadian literature all the way through the Confederation poets. If you'd like to learn more I, as well, there will be a part three in which we look at contemporary. But for now, welcome into 19th and 20th century English Canadian literature. Let's start with fiction. In the 19th century, many fiction writers, among them Susanna Moody and Julia Catherine Beckwith Hart, wrote conventional adventures that featured murder, love, and suspense, and used foreign characters and settings. Now Hart's dramatic tale, St. Ursula's Convent, or The Nun of Canada from 1824, was the first novel by a Canadian-born author and to be published in Canada. Set in a convent, the novel is noteworthy for its use of what were then popular conventions such as mysterious kidnappings and mistaken identities. Hart's novel was the first extended work to appear from a Canadian press, which was Hugh Thompson's newspaper press in Kingston, Ontario. But it wasn't just about murder and love, we also see humor. Thomas Chandler Halliburton's humorous stories about a Yankee clock peddler named Sam Slick appeared in the Nova Scotian newspaper. These sketches provided Halliburton with a means to criticize Nova Scotian political and social life by exposing its susceptibility to behaviors perceived as American. Sam's abilities as a fast-talking salesman, for example. The Sam Slick stories were published later as The Clockmaker in three series in 1836, 1838 and 1840, and as the attaché in 1843 and under other titles. These stories contributed many familiar expressions to English speech. Continuing on into Canadian-born John Richardson, he was an officer in the British Army, set his Wakusta in and near Fort Detroit during an uprising of the native peoples against the British that had begun in 1763. While concerned with the conflicts between Imperial British forces and the native peoples, and with the metaphoric battle between civilization and wilderness, Wakusta is a much more effective when read as a nightmarish tale of romance and revenge rather than of an untitled history. Now the book's main character, Wakusta, is a Scotsman originally named Reginald Morton who allies himself to the native peoples rebelling against British rule. Wakusta seeks vengeance against his arch enemy, Colonel de Haldemar, who serves with the British forces, and the novel culminates in a number of violent conflicts. Continuing on into the romance and even outright melodrama, both William Kirby in The Golden Dog of 1877 and Gilbert Parker in The Seats of the Mighty in 1896 romanticized the refinement and charm of French society in Quebec. They also criticized the excesses of French society by equipping it with darkly mysterious and melodramatic trappings, such as cryptic messages, underground passages, and villainous behavior. Both historical adventure tales take place at the time of the Seven Years' War, which ended with France ceding most of its Canadian territories to Britain in 1763. Next, we have Canadian writer and illustrator Ernest Thompson Seton. He is best known for his keen observation of the natural world. In Wild Animals I Have Known of 1898, Seton creates short, often humorous biographies of individual creatures that he considers exceptional. One biography that appears in the book recounts the adventures of Silverspot, an unusually intelligent crow. Silverspot uses his gifts to his own benefit but he also shares valuable lessons with younger crows. Next, we can see personal narratives. Now, personal narratives include journals written by explorers, travelers, and settlers. These can also include autobiographies and diaries of pioneers and politicians, and short sketches and personal anecdotes that originally appeared in regional periodicals. In these works, writers responded to their environments with a level of precise detail that was missing in most fiction of the same period. 
Both Catherine Partrail and her sister Susanna Moody wrote about their experiences as English immigrants in rural Canada in the 1830s. Trail's book, The Backwards of Canada in 1836, was written as a series of letters and details the customs and natural history of her new country. Susanna Moody herself emigrated from England to Canada in 1832 with her husband John Moody and their infant daughter. Like many other settlers, Moody was determined to recreate in her adopted homeland the orderly civilized life she and her family had enjoyed in England. Pioneer living proved to be more raw and demanding than Moody had imagined, however. In Roughing It in the Bush, first published in England in 1852, Moody included sketches abounding in anecdotal descriptions of fire, planting, death, climate, neighbors, and local customs. Now, towards the end of the 19th century, an anti-romantic trend began with the publication of a strange manuscript found in a copper cylinder of 1888 by James DeMille. Set in the Antarctic, the story satirizes utopian sentiments in its portrayal of the society of a kindly, though death-loving, cannibalistic people called the Koskin. This anti-romantic trend continued in the 1890s and early 1900s in social comedies such as Sarah Jeanette Duncan's, the ironic and often comic depic depictions as well of childhood by Lucy Maud Montgomery in Anne of Green Gables in 1908 and her other works, and the popular urban satires of largely forgotten writers such as Grant Allen and Albert Hickman. But continuing on into the early 20th century, each wave of newcomers to Canada, whether they were British, French, Eastern European, or South and East Asian, they either learned to adapt to the land and the wilderness and provincial life, or they severed itself from that life. In the process, each new group either helped develop a language equipped to realistically render the experiences of the new nation, or continued to emulate the fashions that were set elsewhere. Now, Canadian literature throughout the 20th century continued to reflect this tension between the idea of progress, which was represented variously by technology, literary experiment, and social reform, and a commitment to tradition in the form of received literary conventions, religious faith, and social institutions. As we continue into the 20th century, we meet Stephen Butler Leacock, and he was a Canadian writer and an economist. As a writer, he is famous for humorously debunking the conventions used by other writers. For example, in the nonsense novels of 1911, Leacock parodied 19th century literary forms such as the melodrama, the dialect anecdote, and the romance adventure. In his Arcadian Adventures with the Idle Rich of 1914, he punctured the pretenses to sophistication of the urban rich by showing those pretenses to be nothing more than ego, faddishness, and greed. Now, in his most coherent and enduring work, Sunshine, Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town of 1912, Leacock portrayed the foibles of small town life, specifically the desire of small town inhabitants to resemble their urban counterparts, whom they mistakenly took to be more sophisticated. It is believed that Aurelia, Ontario, inspired the conception of Mariposa, the little town. He writes in the introduction, Mariposa is not a real town. On the contrary, it is about 70 or 80 of them. You may find them all the way from Lake Superior to the sea, with the same square streets and the same maple trees and the same churches and hotels. Now, his sources of humor were mainly from Alphonse Daudet, Charles Dickens, and Mark Twain. As we continue on into social criticism, later 20th century humorists, including Peter MacArthur, Robertson Davies, which writes under the name of Samuel March Banks, Robert Thomas Allen, Gregory Clark, Erica Ritter, Ray Guy, Sandra Gottlieb, and Eric Nickel, they all published in newspapers using their problems such as technological confusion, gender uncertainty, and increasing Americanization. Paul Hebert's Sarah Binks of 1947 parodies literary pretensions of grandeur, while David McFadden's Trip Around Lake Ontario of 1988 
deals comically with issues of nationality and the American border. Some critics have asserted that the sharp sense of irony used by these humorists characterizes the Canadian literary voice. With our fiction, as we continue into the 20th century, we look at the ideas of war and national identity. Now, much of the literature that emerged after World War I attempted to capture the war's horrors and their effects on those who survived. Douglas Durkin's work, The Magpie of 1923, documents the social isolation and the confusion of Craig Forrester, a young veteran who returns to his hometown but finds that everything has changed. Craig's mind flashes between present life and the battlefield, and he feels uneasy, even in the mundane events, events of everyday life. Now, World War I and World War II altered communication systems, destroyed whole communities, and much of a generation. It also changed immigration patterns. However, by providing a common experience, the war has also provided Canadian writers with a means for expressing national unity. Examples of such war fiction include Charles Yale Harrison's General's Die in Bed of 1930, which attacks war itself and the hierarchy of authority that sacrifices ordinary lives in the name of order. We also have Earl Burney's Turvey, which satirizes the Canadian Intelligence Service. Barometer Rising of 1941 by Hugh McLennan uses the Halifax Explosion of 1917 when a Belgian ship and a French munitions ship collided and they exploded in the Halifax Harbor as an allegory of war and as a defining moment in national self-awareness. Now, Mazo de la Roche's popular novel, Jalna of 1927, was followed by a series depicting the history through 150 years of the vigorous White Oak family who lived at Jalna. The series includes 16 novels. Among them are The White Oaks, which starts in 1929, Finch's Fortune, Young Rennie, White Oak Harvest, Growth of a Man, The Building of Jalna, and Mary Wakefield. Her dramatization of White Oaks was staged in London and New York. De La Roche also wrote plays and children's books, a history of Quebec, and an autobiography, The Ringing of the Changes of 1957. But of course, with the 20th century and with the wars, preoccupation with Europe colored the work of the two most important prose writers of the time, Frederick Philip Grove and Morley Callaghan. Grove's life was perhaps even more interesting than his fiction. His so-called autobiography, In Search of Myself, of 1946, is a tissue of fiction. He invented a European past for himself that went unchallenged until a biography of Grove, FPG, was published by Canadian literary scholar D. O. Spedigue in 1973. Spedigue showed that Grove was the name adopted by German translator, novelist, and convicted felon Felix Paul Greve, who had disappeared from Germany in 1909 and was presumed dead. Now in 1922, Grove published his first work set in Canada, Over Prairie Trails, which was a book of purportedly autobiographical essays about travels over the Manitoba countryside. The work was followed by 11 more books, mostly novels about European settlers on the Canadian prairies. And that records a passionate yet largely pessimistic view of human beings in stolid conflict with the land, their fellows, and themselves. Settlers of the March, A Search for America, and Fruits of the Earth are representative of Grove's accomplishment. Now, unlike Grove, Morley Callaghan did not strive to portray grand views of human destiny. In Such as My Beloved of 1934, and The Loved and the Lost of 1951, Callaghan's characters are ordinary urban people, priests, boxers, street workers, small business people, who in the name of something they hold to be good, find themselves in moral predicaments. In The Loved and the Lost, one character struggles with his desire for money and fame and his love for a woman who has rejected those values. In many of Callaghan's works, Social structures, such as the legal system, are portrayed as unable to distinguish the pure motives that have led to individuals' social transgressions, and they punish the wrong people. 
Now, a contemporary and friend of American writer Ernest Hemingway, Callaghan published in avant-garde American literary journals of the 1920s and 30s, such as Transition. His sketches, represented in Morley Callaghan's Stories of 1959, are among his most lasting works. Continuing on into the poetry of the early 20th century, as Callaghan refashioned the concerns and techniques of Canadian prose after World War I, focusing on urban settings and social issues, a group of poets and painters rose to challenge Canadian wilderness mythologies and the conventions of landscape art. <laughs> 